Hey everyone, welcome back to Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux, open source, and uh, I gotta fix the wheel on this chair. It goes click clack. <laughs> Clunk. I got my own. I, I don't have a clacky keyboard, Jill. I just got a clacky chair sometimes if I move it just right. Okay. Like clunk. Oh man, <laughs> yes. we were talking about that right before we started recording. Somebody wrote in. They're like, "Hey man, how do, how do I silence my um, mechanical keyboard sounds when I'm doing live streams? How would you do that, Jill?" Uh, well, uh, you could use a membrane keyboard or, or just get a better mic <laughs> that's more directional and, uh, use uh, brown keys or red keys or black keys. That does help a lot on the, on the mechanical keyboards. <laughs> Correct answer. You had it right, right out of the gate. Don't use a mechanical keyboard when you're streaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's the, um, also like, yeah, here, here's your free pro tip. Get a dynamic mic. Get a dynamic mic. Mm -hmm. Don't use a condenser mic. Yeah. And don't use something that makes noise. I, it, I could hold up any other like <laughs> noise making device. And you're like, that's silly, Vin. Why do you have a noise making device near your microphone? Of course you're going to hear that. <laughs> but if you turn that noise making device into, you know, a keyboard, they're like, but I don't understand. Why is it picking up my noise making device? Let me tell you why. Because it's a microphone and it's making noise. There you go. <laughs> and it's amplifying it. Yes. <laughs> Get off my lawn. Jill, what's new with you, man? Oh, boy. Well, I just realized that this week is actually my four year anniversary of being here on LWDW. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> It's it's been so wonderful and fun being with Vin, and I do miss Pedro a lot, but I'm still here with Vin, so that's cool. <laughs> I, I could I tell you show. how long the show's been going if you held uh, like a loaded penguin to my head. I like no idea. <laughs> it's just uh, yeah, time flies. Time does yeah fly. <laughs> um, speaking of shows, we had that wacky Lutris kid. You ever played around with Lutris? You know, I hear oh, System76 yes. enjoys it because their phone system runs off of it. Um, but yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> if you want to, uh, if you uh, want to play something outside of Steam, you want to play your GOG library, classic games, and stuff like that. It, it's been around a lot longer than Proton, and uh, Matthew does the project. He's the lead developer on that. We uh, had him come on the show. It's previous Saturday. You can go back, watch the video, listen to the podcast, and he talks about you know he's got a Steam Deck. Playing with Lutris on the Steam Deck, what he likes about the Steam Deck, and just like getting Lutris in a flat pack. What are some plans in the future? And, uh, you know, I, I asked him a couple other questions. So go back and watch that if you want. I think it might be kind of fun. But let's see. Uh, I bought a power supply, Jill. I, I was very, oh, oh my HDMI, cool. HDMI splitter showed up too. I, it was a welcome. Welcome to getting excited about weird, pointless things. I wasn't very excited. I'm like, oh, no, I got to go install that HDMI splitter. Fortunately, there wasn't a problem. <laughs> but I did get this. There. That is my PSAC. Aww. That is a rack-mounted power supply because I need things like that now. And, okay, I now have That's one. That's so cool. <laughs> it is exceedingly Old school. red. <laughs> yeah, it's got a big chunky switch on the front of it. And clunk. Like, okay, hey, does Okay. Here was the moment, though. The thing that I bought it for has a power button on it that I accidentally depressed when I was pulling everything out of the rack and repositioning it. So, of course, I cut everything on and I cut on the power supply and the preamp doesn't cut on. I'm like, lovely. I just got something that doesn't work. I'm going to have to send this back and I'm gonna have to put it in a box and it's, it's going to be boring. But fortunately, before I pulled everything apart, I thought, hey, wait a minute, click, and I cut the power button on. I'm like, ah, there it is. Everything works. I was excited. Hmm. Yeah, that's always that's always nerve wracking, Ben. <laughs> 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 Seeing if it's going to fire up, just like when you build a computer and you turn it on for the first time. <laughs> it's never a good time, but fortunately, everything worked out. Um, checking if it was on save the day now yeah <laughs> we do have some exciting things going on one of those being yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> uh, we i gotta say i i'm not a fan of this name asahi linux asahi linux yes i i wonder i want to call it like cupertino stomper 9000 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we talked about it several times. Uh, Mark Adden, he's been working on getting everything up and running Linux seat wise on the M1 architecture. And we finally have the first alpha release and everything works perfectly out of the box. No, it doesn't. But this is to be expected. A couple of things mm-hmm. that you need to find out about. Uh, you're going to need 15 gigs for your Asahi Linux desktop, but uh, Mac OS itself needs uh, a lot more free space for the system to work. The installer will expect you to have at least 38 gigabytes of extra slack in Mac OS by default to avoid shooting yourself in the foot. So keep that in mind. <laughs> this is not like ready to be put on for a daily driver. This is for developers, not end users. Keep that in mind because there's things like no support mm-hmm. for accelerated GPU, DisplayPort, Thunderbolt, no camera or touch bar support, full support for USB 3 and the speakers in the works, in the works. Yay. And uh, there is a note that if your Wi-Fi doesn't work properly, try cutting it off and on again, because that seems to get everything <laughs> sorted. That was kind of interesting that you know, the <laughs> Linux kernel uh, for Asahi is compiled to use 16K pages. So some apps are not going to work. I don't think like Firefox or Chrome or anything like that. It's going to be able to, and again, this is to start testing. This is start getting feedback from end users and finding new and exciting ways to break things. Pretty, pretty excited about it. Yeah. And I know they also said that the alpha uh, build um, is meant to install um, besides Mac OS. They don't have just a, a standalone install yet for, for Asahi Linux, but that is co- of course coming. And the system requirements are actually the M1, the M1 Pro, the M1 Max, but not the latest Mac Studio yet. Um, That will come in a future release. And, you know, because this is an alpha release and the Asahi developers have worked so hard and want to improve their distro, if you install it, they are asking for your help by filing detailed bug reports and helping debug issues. So just like, like any other open source project, please contribute. <laughs> it really will help them. And it will help them improve Asahi Linux and get Linux running on one of the best new processors out there. And I, I don't think it's as crazy as it sounds because when you're pitching this, you're saying, yes, the people who bought uh, an M1 are going to put Linux on it. There's a lot more crossover than you might initially think of people who have at least some Apple hardware, be it from work now. So your work mm-hmm. laptop, probably not a good idea to do this. I'm not going to stop you. I'm, I'm, I'm not your parents, but uh, we were talking about this. It's kind of a hard sell to go out. Like even in the used market, you're still looking at like $900,000 for a little M1 brick. Might not be within your budgets. And I understand that because what am I going to do with this? I've never used the Apple side of it. Nothing against using mac os x but there's nothing on there that i have any need for so dropping a thousand dollars for like admittedly something (laughs) really cool to play with would be irresponsible ish yeah kind of irresponsible yeah i was telling van i went the i went the imac m1 um the pink one really bad and i've been looking for used ones and refurbished ones and they're all close to still the thousand dollar mark even used or refurbished so i need to wait until they come down to at least half that (laughs) yeah yeah you gotta catch it you gotta be careful you gotta make sure you grab it when it's uh yeah yeah, before they start getting color. How much does the, because uh, I have one app, no, I have two Apple devices. I have like an old PPC pack, and, uh, but I have the original um, Apple TV. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, I still have mine too. I still have one too. <laughs> I actually grabbed one for 30 bucks one time on eBay. I'm like, oh, it's only $3. Okay. <laughs> bought that to put Linux so, on it just to play around with. And, but they, they were, yeah. yeah, it was old and outdated when I bought it. But, um, Maybe I look forward into like five to seven years, maybe picking up an M1 for a couple hundred bucks to play around. Yeah. With. Yeah. Right. And absolutely. We'll, we'll have the advantage by then. Everything will just work out of the box. It'll be awesome. Very true. <laughs> if we have patience, all things will work. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Uh, we have a brand new logo and man, yeah. if there's something people say about me is I just can't get enough of design. I really folk. I don't, not at all, but Jill does. Oh, yes, absolutely. So Ubuntu has a brand new logo, but don't worry, worry, it still has the white and orange colors that we're all used to seeing for the many years of using Ubuntu. 
And what's really cool is the circle of friends motif graphic is still there, but it, it's actually a much tighter design and more unified. So now, and if you didn't know, the there's actually <laughs> three people that make up the Ubuntu logo, and they're called the Circle of Friends. And now they are actually embracing or hugging with their heads uh, pointed inwards into the circle instead of outwards and holding hands like the previous logos. And also the logo is now on the bottom, actually, of a tall orange rectangle. And it is almost as if they are saying, let's make great things together because the sky or the cloud is the limit. And, you know, really this new logo embodies a more modern representation of Canonical's growth and the cloud, the Internet of Things and AI. And it, it really makes sense. They, they needed to modernize it. It hadn't been... Uh, worked on since the uh, middle 2000s. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's nice to get a newer modern logo. And even the Ubuntu text has uh, become more slimmer and more modern looking. So it just makes sense. And I actually really appreciate the logo. It's, um, they, it is really clean and modern. And I think they did a good job at moving the heads of the, the three people inside the circle because it, it, it's more friendlier somehow. It's just, it's, it's nicer. I, I mean, I take a look at it. I mean, it's so radical. It's so forward-thinking. <laughs> Cosm cosmically different. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm struck, just speechless that yeah. you, you created Hell 9000 canonical. I mean, seriously, that's what you did. Well, yes. That's, <laughs> that, that's what we got. That's what we got. Anyway, uh, I hey, I understand people put time and effort into that and cool, but there's a lot of us like, we need to go be productive somewhere, but Hey, it's a, it's yeah. a thing. The, the dots of, for my people, for my, they moved some dots around. I don't think it affects anything uh, that matters, but Hey, I mean, Jill, you notice stuff like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, I think this, the logo also really embodies what Ubuntu means, which is actually humanity. Or an, another word is like humanity coming together, being a community. And, and this really embodies that uh, changing. Just like Hal 9000. <laughs> well, Vin isn't Dave, but he might want to be. <laughs> this is what we're going to think about. We're just like, I'm sorry. I, that's what it's going to do when you like try to run something without pseudo. It's like, I can't do that, Hal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um we just thought that was a fun thing to mention and yeah I, again i have nothing against like logos and stuff like that you you can put like typography and stuff in front of me and like there's a difference there grandpa and i'm like i just can't see it but hey if, if, <laughs> if, if that's your thing um go for it more power to you colonel 517 though nothing terribly crazy in this nothing earth shattering and i think that's not necessarily a bad thing yeah. Yeah. So Linus Torvalds, you know, announced the release of, of the Linux kernel 5.17 this last Sunday, as he always does on Sundays. And it includes lots of new support for processors, graphic card storage, and hardware. So it's it's not the biggest update, but it, it, it does uh, have some very important features. Um, it includes temperature support for the AMD Zen family of devices, which is always needed <laughs> and has been needed for a while. And one of my favorites is it has a fix to a longstanding floppy disk hangs bug where the system may hang when trying to read a broken floppy disk. And honestly, as I was reading this, I was remembering I've encountered this before and I would have to reboot the computer to get it out of trying to read a bad floppy. It was being, it would, it was stuck in a loop and you couldn't do anything else in the terminal. <laughs> that was a pain. <laughs> so it's just nice to see the Linux kernel being updated to fix issues with older hardware. And uh, with uh, for all my older computers I use that still have floppy disks in them, which are many of them. <laughs> you know so. what? I'm glad that they got this fixed and sorted just in time to remove support for the FDD controller from the kernel. Because yeah. why is that? <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Then. And, uh, you know, from debugpoint.com, all this is going to be in our show notes. Uh, the, the one thing I'm thinking about, uh, the... 
what it says in the article. Who uses floppy disks today? And I have to think of it. That would require having floppy disks that you can still read and that are of use. Like, outside yeah. of YouTube video creators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I have some floppy disks? Yes, I do. Because I think anybody of a certain age, you still have like that one pop open thing with some disk in it somewhere for whatever oh, reason. I, yeah. <laughs> yes, I actually still have literally over a thousand floppy disks. I still have all the floppy disks I've ever owned. And I would back them up on zip drives, zip disks, and then SideQuest drives, and, and eventually CDs and DVDs. So I have all that, uh, all those floppies from doing animation back in the day when we had to use floppies in the 80s. It was a thing. <laughs> so. And kind of one of the interesting things about that is you can probably read a lot more of those floppies than you could those burnt CDs today. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have I have a little external USB floppy drive that I still you know they they still work. That's always the <laughs> they um, work well. Longevity now, like most people, I I put everything pro, you know I, I I write to like stone tablet. That's the best way to do it. You know for archive. <laughs> yeah, but write speeds a little slow admittedly um no this is good a uh, couple yeah. of hardware updates uh notable yeah. hardware updates uh, real-time clock driver for the nintendo gamecube because that's a thing but that's until important. older like in <laughs> audio support which yes. is also good to see yeah that's yes and that was kind of funny, especially uh, for our future intel gpus that we're waiting very uh, patiently for <laughs> I want to see what's going on with that. But, you know, yeah. we, we did see, we were talking about this on Saturday. Uh, somebody had managed to get Windows 11 and, of course, Windows 10 because Valve has released, uh, you know, some basic drivers from AMD for the Steam Deck. And yeah. it, most things kind of sort of work for the most part. But at the end of the day, there's no audio <laughs> on Windows and Steam Deck. So, yeah. kudos, yes. kudos, Microsoft. Yes. You finally achieved feature parity with Linux. Um, <laughs> Well, it, um, in fact, in this version of the Linux kernel 5.17, there's the now the inclusion of the AMD P-State driver, which is actually developed in collaboration with Valve for the Steam Deck, and will this will lead to better power performance on the Steam Deck. So we're already, you know, seeing the uh, results of uh, our beloved Steam Decks um, and uh, their collaboration with the Linux kernel. It's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> so audio on linux believe it or not does work despite what the internet says Woohoo! i've been over this a million <laughs> times linux doesn't care whether or not you're smart enough to use it but that's not going to stop mm. you from blaming it for not knowing what you're doing mm. <laughs> it, it happens it happens yes <laughs> I, I think that's something just built into a lot of people if you can't figure out how to do something with a thing it doesn't matter if it's software or mechanical or anything. that thing's stupid because you can't figure out how to use it all by yourself without doing any research on it whatsoever and like that thing's done mm -hmm. linux is, can kind of be like that and i do a series trying to help people clear up some things called interfacing Linux, just covering some audio backend stuff, stuff that I do here, but also slowly but surely compiling a list of audio devices that more or less either do work out of the box with Linux or just don't. And I was kind of fascinated by a French company that's been in the business of pro audio for a long time because they have official Linux support. In fact, like for their newer devices, mm -hmm. they even have a GitHub repo where you can go download the drivers, compile them yourself, and there's built-in support, official support from them inside the Linux kernel. I'm talking about Digigram. This video took longer to make than it should have because I had to get less angry in order to finish making it. There's <laughs> versions of this video that no one's ever going to see because that is like <laughs> me being genuinely oh cross. <laughs> I'm talking about the VX... 222E. This is, uh, you know, it's a two in, two out. Look at that. Look at my big French instrument. No, um, <laughs> you know, I picked it up because I wanted to show this thing off. I want to show off interface with open source drivers, official Linux support. Instead, instead, about two hours after I got this, I, I was Googling whether or not dumpster fire was hyphenated or not, which I don't know where you want to be. I mean, it does work as your basic two in, two out sound card, and that's about it. Really, the only fancy thing this card does is that it can handle AES, digital audio 
you get two channels in, two channels out. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I started running into kind of the same problems I did with my VX222V2 is this is a PCI card that's been bolted onto a PCI Express interface. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Something you never want to do. It's a bad idea. <laughs> it's the reason the 222V2. I talked to some ULSA developers about the V222 uh, V2, and they're like, yeah, they, they bolted an ISA card onto a PCI interface, and we just got tired of trying to make it work right. So continuing in oh. that tradition, this is a PCI card on a PCI Express interface. And I'm thinking, hey, man, finally, PCI Express. I don't have to worry about getting a motherboard with legacy support. Uh -uh. Now, you will see, you're like, hey, man, that's a Xilinx um, FPGA can do some cool stuff. And you would be right. I mean, it's got a three-band parametric equalizer, sonic maximizer, and a bunch of cool little fun things that they don't offer support for under Linux. You find that out once you get the card and start playing around with it. And uh, here's what I'll say about it. It's got, like, it does work with Jack. But in order to get it up and running with Jack, you have to set a buffer size so high it introduces. Look at it, it's even a little headphone jack. Ain't that adorable? Um, mm -hmm. The round trip latency is laughably high. It's unusably high for real time monitoring. And here's the biggest here's the biggest problem with it. Okay, you get breakout cables. Where I you know I, I there's nothing new there. I mean XLR and AES. By the way. I do want to point out, if your IS number is six or above, you got to go compile your own drivers. Keep that in mind. Also, Mixer works. I mean, it, everything's there. You could use this as a sound card. If you just wanted to use this as a standard sound card for your Linux box, it'll work 100%. No problem whatsoever. It's just when you try to start doing things with Jack, an actual production, professional production stuff, it just, it, it's bad. It's bad. You're looking at like 58 hmm. milliseconds of round trip latency. Okay, look, look at this hmm. at 48K at buffer size 128. It's 30.24 milliseconds. A $99 Scarlet <laughs> Gen 3, which I bought. There's a video on does it in six. So I, yeah, th there's your difference. But here's the biggest problem. Here's the biggest problem. That. These things are about $600, Jill. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Finn, I don't know if you remember, but the first six months I was on LWW, I was using one of those cards, a PCI version, <laughs> with my microphone. <laughs> it worked well. It worked well. <laughs> but then I got a new mic and I updated to a USB interface. <laughs> so, yeah, and I kind of remember when you, when you said it was a... PCI and a PCI X form factor, and the PC, P, PCI one was an ISA into a PCI. Kind of, I remember reading about that. <laughs> yeah, the um, PCI versions of those just don't function correctly at all under Linux because I have one of those too. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah. I went through it, and then, yeah, I talked with the also developers, and they're like, "Yeah, they, they, these things are dodgy, and we don't deal with it because uh, Digigram." does the drivers themselves. I'm like, yeah, all right. Maybe I want to make this point. These things might work an absolute treat under Windows. Yeah. But under Linux, you know, there you go. That's what I found out. And mm. uh, I would not recommend anyone owning one intentionally. Like, <laughs> yeah. if you had nothing I remember in installing house. really old drivers for it. Someone had made some Linux drivers. <laughs> uh, Digigram make, it makes the Linux Digi drivers Dim. for it. Digigram, yeah. And they're built some the old kernel. ones. Yeah. Yeah. I got a PCI. <laughs> I got a 222v2. I've done a whole article and write up on it. If you want to okay, go find that at cool. linuxgamecast.com. But that's not the only audio related stuff I want to talk about this week because I brought up that Scarlet when I was talking about that, that little YouTuber special, the Focus Race Scarlet. And if you got a nicer one, you know, something a little more grunt for it, you might have played around looking for a mixer. And also a mixer, that's, that's kind of a pain to deal with because, well, I mean, it's confusing. You pull it up with something with 100 controls, that's a lot of scrolling. This aims to help sort some of that. And no, I know, I know. You're like, wait a minute, that's a command line. No, it's just to open the awesome 
also scarlet gooey and this is a slick little piece what do you think about this jill does you think this looks all right oh yeah i thought it looked beautiful in fact i thought it looked nicer than uh, the q jack ctl uh patch bay <laughs> it's it's very very sleek and nice looking and it looks easy to use it is and i, I mean it works with everything now only like the um 4i4s and the 1820 to what okay yeah for like the Single channel, two channel, you don't get all the mixing stuff because they don't have an internal mixer, but you will get access to be able to cut up the air button on and off, switch the phantom power line button, direct monitoring. All of that's built into it. But if you have an 1820 or 4i4, you get all of the internal routing so you can make your own custom mixes and do all the other fun stuff with it. And yeah, I just wanted to give this project a mention. Uh, there is one mm -hmm. Robin made one for the gen 2 18i 20 and uh i mean it's still around it's one that you've probably discovered looking around but it, it, it's a bit older this is a more updated and it's using gtk4 which means i can't run it because i'm on debian and i'm not going down that rabbit hole of setting up gtk4 I, as far as i went was like app search gtk nope not there nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> understand <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if you get a Scarlet uh, and you want, get, we need stuff like this. I mean, to me. Awesome. Not really a big deal, but we, you know, somebody moving over, they need the transitional software. They need their buttons. They need the GUI application right there in front of them. Like, hey, I want to cut this on, cut this on, or if I want to do basic routing, how do I do that? And that's a big, big question. Like voice meter banana. I'm like, okay, this will give you the things that you can drag around and you don't have to use Jack in order to get it set up and running so yeah i mean focus right i mean mm. it's perfectly serviceable for what it is i think yeah. i think it's a little overpriced but hey you could do a lot worse that's what i said about um the one i picked up and i i mean i have a sapphire pro 40 from focus right you know i got a big chunky and like it's fine i don't have a problem with it um we got anything else on that i don't think so is mm -mm. that do it we, we got to thank some people, Joe. We do. Yeah, we've got got to thank Pebble. He's our a new our new executive producer. Thank you so much, Pebble. Executive producer. What are you talking about? Or, How does or her that work? Chat. How do I become an executive producer, Joe? Oh boy. Well, you just go to uh, Patreon.com and uh, sign up. Uh, there we have different different levels that you can. Uh, um, sign up for you could <laughs> different at different uh, price rates per per week and the executive producer is the second to the top one under advisor <laughs> just don't enter and the you konami get, code yeah we got a bunch of yeah. rewards. we got a bunch of things man we got access yeah, you get to, access to show notes show discord notes. you get a custom live yeah. video channel for our pre pre super yeah, shows and absolutely. if you want to watch it on saturdays but we do invite you to come hang out with us and if you like just this middle part and you're listening to this, you're like, that's oh, pretty decent. I want to listen to these dorks uh, talk some more. This is just the middle of the show. We do a pre-show and after show. We put that in podcast format. We put that out there in your custom RSS feeds. All this is over on our YouTube channel. If you want to check that out as well. But I do want to thank Pebble. Executive, I remembered to put you in the credits. Hey, also. Yay, Yay good. <laughs> all of our credits, I do manually each and every week. So sometimes things slip through the crack. If you're in the wrong spot, if your name's not appearing on the credits, let me know. It's just, hey, I let Ben yeah. know. It, 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 it's fluid. It changes per day. <laughs> I, I have seen your moments of like, I'm going to yeah. do that. Oh, I didn't do that. Then squirrel. <laughs> Thing happens. But yeah, thanks for um, becoming a patron. Come hop in Discord. Come say hi. You can do that if you're a Twitch sub as well. It is fun. It is brilliant. I appreciate everyone that does that. And just say hello. Come join us for Track Media this Friday. Also, if you mm -hmm. want to do that. Woohoo. Yeah, you can do what we're doing. We're trying to figure out this this fancy brand new cutting edge racing game from 2011 because yeah. that's how we roll. And it's mm -hmm. all for good fun. It is. Yeah. Um, we have a wonderful community and, you, and all our patrons can come and talk with us. So very, very special. You We're uh, very open. Listen to, to other patrons scream yeah. and frustration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is fun. But head over to LinuxGameCast.com. That's where you can get the show. And uh, we got a support page. We got Amazon wish list, all the kind of fun stuff. We just do this for fun. So, yeah, don't run out and buy a 
mattress or whatever. I don't know what I'm supposed to plug. <laughs> Brought to you by Microsoft. <laughs> I would so do a Microsoft ad. Uh, we got to do a slice of pie, though. Yeah, we do. So hmm. you're going to be talking about... What's our... <laughs> I, I was on a Hell 9000 kick. So there's yes, a there's Hell a Hell 9000 cake. cake. My Steve husband would love this. That's his favorite movie of all time. So... <laughs> Has anyone, like, so, Ven is Dave today, that's for sure. I don't necessarily... Dave, I cannot think anymore. I'm, I'm not going to call it a horrible movie, Steve, but there, there's, a, that, 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 there's a lot of hype to that movie. I think the biggest problem with that movie is, like, if it's a cinematic masterpiece, I'm like, it's all right. But don't you dare say... It's all right around somebody who's like frothing at the mouse. Like, no, it's it's okay. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's cool enough to where I'm like, hey, I know what Hell Nine Thousand is. It's a cake. Aw, well, you know, it's bit the big deal about about uh, oh, big deal about uh, <laughs> the movie is it was uh, 2001. Is that it was a movie, and not just cinematically, but story-wise. It was a movie not uh, about the p- future, but from the future. And that's what differentiated it from other sci-fi See, movies at the time. See, this is exactly why people important. have a problem with the movie, Joe, because they're like, well, you got to really understand it. And they're like, they go and watching this transformational experience. They're like, yeah, it's a movie. It's an old movie. Yeah. yeah. All right. Like, like Stephen husband, husband says, no one will ever do that much work again to make a film. It, it was one of the hardest films ever made by Stanley Kubrick and one of the most challenging and one of the most expensive because he was a perfectionist. Everything had to be accurate. Oh, no. <laughs> quit, quit. See, my husband's in chat. I know. <laughs> quit driving people away. We want people to watch this, Jill. You're not doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it was but, over man. budget done by a control freak. I'm like, I bet that turned out pretty well, didn't it? Oh, then there is something more cray cray than uh, 2001, the movie from the late 60s. And that is that you can make a cluster of your Pi Zeros in the style of a 3D printed Cray 1 supercomputer from the 1970s. This is awesome. See, I'd watch that. <laughs> yeah. So, this is what Kevin McCallier did so he could use a compact and affordable playground to experiment with things like parallel computing, load balancing, and to learn, you know, how just how clustering works. And he was looking to learn more about deploying software using Docker, Ansible, Flask, and and other, you know, modern fr- frameworks out there. And it just, I, I thought this was an ingenious way to, to do it and inexpensive. So all you need is uh, to make your own is a dozen Raspberry Pi Zero 2s, M.2.5 M2. standoffs and matching screws and a 3D printer to print out all the parts. And the beauty of the symmetrical design of the Cray 1 is such that each individual wedge is made up of the same identical set of 3D printed parts. So <laughs> so you could just have them, you know, make a part and and have several run overnight, you know, get up an hour later and put it in, <laughs> program another one and then program another one. <laughs> one of the things I like but about I think this is super oh, this cool. Is, this is so much better than actually having like a real cray because yeah, because you don't have the space or the money. Do you know, I looked up what a Cray today would cost over $26 million if mm-hmm. you bought it today. So Because like, it was $8 million when it came out in 1975. Oh, no, that wouldn't be. That'd be like three NVIDIA compute units. <laughs> yes. Or yes. possibly one, <laughs> one thirty nine ETI. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I love the Cray. I was fortunate to be able to uh, stand in the center of one. Um, at the uh, one of the the local computer history museums, and that was a very <laughs> a very 
you know, almost a religious experience. It, it was awesome because it's one of my favorite computers of all time. And it was the original computer that they used to render The Last Starfighter, which is one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. <laughs> The only problem I had with like, the original craze, and if you're thinking about the craze, you, you, we're all thinking about the one that uh, was being shown here, you know, the base. They had one critical yeah. flaw that I never found very useful was the fact that you always, when you were dealing with the actual craze, you had to accessorize because of the color matching. And yes, yes. There were orange ones, there were yellow and blue ones, there were brown ones, there were gray ones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, all, all the different uh, colors. Orange, or the orange one was pretty. <laughs> they're neat. Um, but yeah, really. They're so cool. In 2022, I think uh, there's probably a market to make um, furniture, gray furniture. People would buy that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, the bottom part, they called a seat, and that's where, you know, the power supplies were. And yeah, that just makes makes sense for an ottoman you know you have this big circular structure with the, the seats ar- around the outside and then the inside it could be your little little kiosk to watch uh, movies you know you could put a little uh, uh, 1970s uh, orange chair in there and then you s- and then put your uh, your big screen on the wall and there you go your own little that'd be great you have that at private the house. entertainment center Especially if you're out and about, you're on the dating scene, you show up at somebody's house, they got like cray furniture, you know exactly what yeah. you're getting. You're like, all right. Hey, move over 50s modern, you get 70s modern cray furniture. Oh, I man. would like some of that in my life. Retro nerd core. Steve, take notes. No. <laughs> Oh, and give, thank you to Darkwing for letting us, uh, you know, making us aware of this project. It was really cool. He posted it. Yeah. <laughs> So, hmm. speaking of like video cards and just expensive compute units, we've all been dealing with this for the past two years now. Two years. You can't buy anything. Mm-hmm. Everything, scalpers and just and just crazy. Trying to get a like 3090 yeah. Ti. If you're looking at over $1,000 or just like a 20 or a 30, a 2060, $600 on eBay. People are paying that much. Why? Yeah. Scalpers. <laughs> scalpers, crypto, and they're just buying them by the pallets. They're never getting to you. And, you know, EVGA will tell you like, There's, we're doing the best that we can. NVIDIA, you know, to the same thing. Newegg, of course, but like, oh, we're trying everything possible. Stop the scalpers. We, we really care about you. To which everyone looked at uh, the release of the Steam Deck, how Valve went, yeah, we just released a hot new product that everyone wanted and um, didn't really have to deal with scalping at all. How do we do that? <gasps> oh, well, they, they did this crazy, wild <laughs> idea. They, they enabled like two-factor authentication. You had to have a Steam account, but add a fruit. Awesome. I want to give you credit because they're taking that first step. Two-factor authentication for high-demand products due to bots mm-hmm. buying out certain high-demand items, Raspberry Pi 4, Module B. We are now requiring verified account, two-factor authentication. Done. Done. Awesome. Problem solved. But they will say, but then, but Jill, if it was that simple, mm-hmm. why doesn't everybody do it? Because they don't care as long as the yeah. check yeah. clears. They just want the money. EVGA, mm-hmm. Newegg, I'm sorry to pick these two out. Everybody's doing it across the board. Like, they don't care if you are, whether or not you get a video card or anything like or Raspberry Pi. Out of fruits, like, hey, we understand our customer base. And like, let's mm-hmm. make sure that, you know, individual hobbyist projects, schools, places like this, actually get the hot products that are out we get our inventory and we don't want that one person or dozens of people who buy as much as they possibly can and head over to ebay and resell it like what have you done oh i've marked the price up 50 dollars. but have you done anything no no just mark the price up thank you very much here's one uh, <laughs> something as simple as two-factor authentication be it via text or because that that little wrinkle that little bit of friction will keep things mm-hmm. in stock and so this is, makes me very happy to see this. And like Valve did something very similar. They're doing this. Why? Because it's simple to do and it works. If you care about your customers, you take these little baby tiny steps and ensure that the product is there for the people who want to buy it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody's awesome. going to have a problem with it though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we need to 2FA all the things that just, 
that that works. It 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 stops hackers and and uh, well, having a mobile number, yeah, bad just things. that friction to yeah. add a fruit, add a fruit. Check this out. Yeah, do do like the digital thing, but also allow people to send a self addressed stamped envelope. <laughs> I don't know how that'd work, but maybe it would. All right. We're running a bit long, Jill. We got to bounce out of here. Uh, okay. Do we have any famous closing last words other than cue the music? Because that's what I want to do. Aww. Well, get out there and Linux all the things. <laughs> Thank you to all our beautiful patrons and our new executive producer, Pebble. Yay. Thank you so much. Which I remembered to put in the credits. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we got Aldius, Barbrandt, Scott M, and Foxdog, Atomic Ass. What by too quick? I couldn't read it. Chicago. <laughs> Can't say what that one says the at the end. Of sea Chicago. Monsters. Yes. All of it. <laughs> oh, boy. Episode and all our wonderful chairlings. <laughs> Nineteen teen. Oh my god. <laughs> we'll eventually get to a point where I won't be able to count that high. I look forward to it. Yeah. See you next week. <laughs> Bye everyone. Love you. 